Hi, we've been looking at heat engine cycles and in this summary video, we'll compare the four heat engine cycles that we have analyzed so far. Those four cycles we analyzed were Carnot cycle, Auto cycle, Diesel cycle, and Stirling cycle. So that you have it all on one page, let me briefly describe the processes that are involved in each cycle. Here's the PV diagram for the Carnot cycle. So in Carnot cycle, starting from high pressure, low volume, the gas first undergoes isothermal expansion. Then at some point, the expansion continues adiabatically. Then the gas is now contracted isothermally. And at the right point, the gas continues compression adiabatically with the increasing temperature that eventually reaches the initial starting point. The isothermal process happens along an isotherm, indicating all the different pressures and volumes with the same temperature. And while the gas changes temperature, the heat exchange with the surrounding is zero because it's adiabatic. The auto cycle is one of the two internal combustion engine cycles. And here's the PV diagram for the auto cycle. We can start from high pressure, low volume state. At this point, the ignition of the fuel-air mixture occurs. Then the pressure of the gas increases very quickly so that there's no time for volume to change. And once the pressure is at maximum, then the gas expands adiabatically, pushing out the piston in what's sometimes called power stroke. At the end of the stroke, we idealize it as undergoing isochoric cooling process to release waste heat to the surround. And to return the engine to the original system, it is adiabatically compressed to return the point where the fuel and air mixture was originally ignited. Somewhere along the process, having expelled the exhaust, taken in new oxygen-rich air, and and mixed in the fuel. I should note that these two curves are adiabatic. And since it's adiabatic, the temperatures vary throughout the whole process. There's no isothermal process here. The diesel cycle is the second of the internal combustion engine cycles. And here's the PV diagram for the diesel cycle. So let's just start at the state of the engine where it's at high pressure and low volume. At a very high temperature, fuel is injected that ignites, causing the gas to expand isobarically. And that's the idealization. At some point, the expansion continues adiabatically. And at the end of the expansion cycle, the gas undergoes cooling. We idealize it as isochoric cooling. And to return the engine to the original point, it undergoes adiabatic compression where the temperature of the air rises until it's at a point where fuel is ready to be injected, igniting all at once. The isobaric and isochoric processes are clear, and these curves are adiabatic curves. There is a reason all these curves in the internal combustion engine are adiabatic. In an internal combustion engine, there is no real thermal reservoir. The source of heat is the ignition of the fuel-air mixture within the engine. And expelling the waste it happens by, well, expelling the gas <laughs> and taking in new air. Okay, the last of the cycles is the Stirling engine cycle, which is unique in that it is a real engine cycle, unlike a Carnot cycle, and also it is not an internal combustion engine heat is provided externally. You can see that in the engine cycle processes. We'll see. So here the best place to start would be the low pressure, low volume state of the engine. And from this state, the engine is in contact with a high temperature reservoir and absorbs its heat isochorically and reaches the highest pressure 
and then the engine starts to expand. And this we model as isothermal. This is possible because the Stirling engine is in continuous thermal contact with the thermal reservoir. At the end of the expansion cycle, the engine is designed so that the gas is now in contact with the low temperature reservoir. So it undergoes cooling. We idealize it as isochoric cooling. And now to reach the original starting point, the gas remains in contact with the low temperature reservoir and heat is being removed from the gas as it's compressed. So like with the Carnot cycle, with the Stirling cycle, the upper and lower curves are on two different isotherms. And the distinction from the Carnot cycle would be whereas in the Carnot cycle, these two isothermal curves are connected by adiabatic curves. In a Stirling cycle, they are connected by isochoric curves. All right, so the point of this summary video is to compare the cycles. So we've been using consistent labels for all four cycles so that we can compare them. They are best labeled on the auto cycle. So we use the high volume and the low volume and the points and this ratio of the volumes is going to be important. And we use as parameter the highest temperature within the heat engine cycle that occurs on the auto cycle at this vertex and the lowest temperature on the cycle that happens at this vertex for the auto cycle. That's it. Uh, let me label all the other diagrams so that they all have these four parameters which we are going to set common between the four cycles so that we can compare them on a similar footing. Same thing for the Stirling cycle. Now with the Stirling cycle, it's special that the entire upper curve is at the high temperature and the entire lower curve is at the lower temperature. With the Carnot cycle, I have to be a little bit careful because looking back at my note, the way the volumes were labeled was rather than using the highest volume in the cycle, I used the volume after the initial isothermal expansion. It doesn't make a real difference in one quantity we care about and the difference it makes on the other quantities are rather negligible. All right, so we need to set some of these parameters. I looked them up and what I see is for auto cycle, the typical compression ratio is 10. In other words, which is approximately equal to 10 times VL. All right, we'll use that. And the second easier thing is the low temperature. We can just assume that the heat is being expelled into the regular surrounding, so room temperature, about 300 Kelvin. Now the biggest thing is the high temperature. I wasn't quite sure what's the right temperature. So I looked up Wikipedia page for something called adiabatic flame temperature. This is the Wikipedia page for adiabatic flame temperature. It's the maximum temperature of flame of some fuel and the air mixture can occur. So for the mixture of gasoline and air, this says that the adiabatic temperature is about 2100 degrees C. Or in Kelvin, this would be about, let's say 2400 Kelvin or so. But um, let me use a slightly lower temperature, let's say 1500 Kelvin. Either way, it doesn't matter a lot for the point I'm trying to illustrate, but 1500 Kelvin sounds more reasonable, so let's use that. So I'm going to label the TH, high temperature, as 1500 Kelvin. All right, so that's all the parameters. We already labeled the other diagrams. So let me write down these parameters on this corner as a reminder for myself. The high temperature is 1500 Kelvin. The low temperature is at room temperature or 300 Kelvin and we'll say high volume is 10 liters or about 0.01 cubic meter and the low volume is about 1 liter or 0.001 cubic meter. By the way, I don't know if these are reasonable parameters for an automobile engine. I'm just uh, um, they are probably reasonable within a factor of 10 or 100. All right, so there's one more parameter we need to nail down, and that would be the number of gas molecules. 
it affects what the pressure is and so on. I think a good value will be this. We'll set number of molecules such that when you multiply it with the Boltzmann constant, that this is equal to 3 joule per Kelvin. I think this number has an upside of making sure that the low temperature point is at approximately one atmosphere. So we derived the formulas in previous videos where we can just plug in these numbers to get the network done, heat input and the heat output. So let's go do that. The first cycle to look at is the Carnot cycle. So all these expressions for work done, heat input and heat output seem to be in terms of parameters we already have numerical value of. So let's uh, plug them in and see what we get. First, QH. Plugging these numbers into my calculator, NK3 times the high temperature, 1500 Kelvin, and the natural log of the ratio of the volumes, so that would be 10. This is what I see when I plug in these numbers into calculator. It's 10,361.6 joules, or rounding it 10,400 joules. Let's keep going. QL. Plug in these numbers into calculator, that is with the substitution of TL for TH, we get 2072.33 joules or rounding it about 2070 joules. So finally the work done is the difference between them but I can also just plug in numbers into this equation. And when you plug in the numbers, this is what you get. The work done is 82, 89 joules. Now, if energy is conserved, then the sum of these two quantities, the rejected heat and, and work done, this is equal to the heat transfer at the higher temperature. Um, 2070 plus 8289 is approximately 10,400, give or take 100. Let me copy these numbers over to the summary page. I will round them to the hundredth place. So the heat transfer then work done for Carnot cycle R. And here is a useful quantity we can define called efficiency that we'll talk about more next week. For now, I will say we define efficiency as work done divided by heat input. So in the case of the Carnot cycle, the efficiency is 0.8 or 80%. Now, because this is actually an unrealistic high number, I need to point out that this is really high temperature, 1,500 Kelvin. It's high enough that if a piece of metal were at that temperature, it'd be glowing white hot. But that is the efficiency we have for such a high temperature. All right, let's move on to the auto cycle. So there are a lot of numbers we hear. We need to calculate them out first. So let me make some space. Uh, first, we are going to calculate all those intermediate numbers that we need. Uh, pressure at B and pressure at D. So plugging the numbers for the temperature, NK, and the volume, I get, using my calculator, PB is 4.5 times 10 to the 6 pascals, or about 45 atmosphere. And PD is uh, 9 times 10 to the 4 pascal or about one atmosphere, as was our design. Let's keep going. We need the temperatures, TC and TA, and plugging all the numbers, TH, VL, VH, and the gamma for monatomic gas, we get for TC, 323 Kelvin, and we get for TA, 1392 Kelvin. Huh, temperature point A is pretty close to the highest temperature, the 1500 Kelvin. We need uh, two more pressure numbers, PA and PC. So PA is NK times TL times volume at high volume raised to the factor of gamma minus one divided by VL raised to the factor of gamma. Putting that into my calculator, I get PA is equal to 
one a times ten to six pascals, and p c is equal to nine point six nine five times ten to four pascal. I don't know if I needed to keep that many significant figures. All right, so we have all the numbers we need. Plugging these numbers in gives us our result. Um, let's calculate the network first. That seems easier. Also, it's the first line. So plugging in 3 halves NK times TH plus TL and the two temperatures we now calculated, TA and TC, we get 380 joules. Huh, it's a much less amount of work than what I saw with the Carnot cycle. Let's keep going. The QH, plugging in the PB and PA that we calculated, we get 484 joules. Huh, so heat input is also small. Oh, I guess I can kind of figure why. So with the auto cycle, the only heat transfer happens along AB and CD. Whereas with the Carnot cycle, the heat transfer was occurring throughout the isothermal process. Uh, let's plug in the numbers to QL. Um, oops, I think I made a sign error there. Um, it should be PC minus PD. So let me do that. And the number I get is 104 joules. All right, and they all seem to check out. When you add QL to the work done, you do get the heat input to the system. Let me copy this over to the summary page. So for the auto cycle, QH is 484 joules. The work done is 380 joules. And the heat exhaust is 104 joules. We can calculate efficiency as before, and it's uh, 78%. Huh, that's interesting. So it's not too far from the efficiency of the Carnot cycle, but it is less. And that's going to be important as we go. We'll see. All right, let's look at the diesel cycle. There are a lot of numbers we need to calculate, so let me make some space here. The preliminary numbers first. So TA is plugging in TL and VH, VL, and gamma. 1392 Kelvin. So like with auto cycle, this is pretty close to the highest temperature of the heat engine cycle. And using this number, I can calculate PA, which is 4.18 times 10 to the 6 Pascal. And we can calculate VB, which is not much more than a liter, what we started out with. It's 1.077 liters, or times 10 to minus 3 cubic meter. TC is, plugging in all these numbers, we get 340 Kelvin. So this is all the numbers we need to calculate the heat transfers and the work done. Let's just uh, go down the screen. Let me free up some space. So the heat input is plugging in all these numbers, 3 halves and K times the difference of the temperatures, plus PA times the difference of the volumes. I get 806 joules. It's also small, like the auto cycle. So I think the same reason applies. Let's calculate QL, the heat output of the heat engine. That's equal to 178 joules. So the network should be different between them, but let me plug in these numbers into my calculator to just double check. And I get 628 joules. That seems reasonable. Let me copy those to the summary page. So for the diesel cycle with these parameters for one loop, QH is 806 joules and QL is 178 joules. And the difference between them is work done, or work done is, I can also copy from the other page, 628 joules. All right, somehow heat input is larger for the diesel cycle. 
And you could uh, credit the isobaric expansion for that. The isobaric expansion does require a lot of heat. All right, let's calculate the efficiency as before. And the efficiency is again about 78%. Now, once again, a reminder, these numbers are based on fairly high temperatures. And actually designing these engines, real world considerations come into play. For example, for an auto cycle, until it reaches this point here, the engine cannot reach temperatures where the fuel air mixture will just ignite on its own. That leads to something called knocking. With a diesel engine, the design is different. The fuel gets injected at that point, so there's no real limit to how much you can compress the air, and the compression ratio does end up improving the efficiency of the engine. All right, so we have one more left, the Stirling engine cycle. Once again, we have a lot of the numbers that we need to work out first. So let me make some space for them. So we need to work out all those pressures. Pressure at point A is 900,000 Pascal or 9 times 10 to the 5 Pascal or about 9 atmosphere. Pressure at point B is even higher, 4.5 times 10 to 6 Pascal. But it's comparable to what we have seen before, which makes sense since we are using the same temperature and volumes. After isothermal expansion to point C, it reaches the pressure of 450,000 pascals, or 4.5 times 10 to the 5 pascals. Pressure at point D should be close to an atmosphere, and it is. It's 9 times 10 to the 4 pascals. So with these four numbers and the parameters we picked earlier to define this system, we can calculate all the heat flows and the work done using the heat flow. So let's write down the heat flow first. I'm using this complicated expression here, um, but where I do know all the numbers, so it's a matter of putting into my calculator. And the result is 15,800 joules. Hmm, that seems larger than before. Let's keep going. The heat output from the engine is 7,500 joules. And the work done is plugging in all the known numbers into the formula for network. We have 8,300 joules per cycle. All right, everything seems to check out. When you add QL and W, you get QH. So let me copy this over to the summary page. So the heat input at the high temperature limit is 15,800 joules. And the work done is um, rounding it up 7,500 joules. All right, the last quantity. QL, the heat outflow into the environment is 8,300 joules. Let's define the efficiency as before, which is 53%. So there are some pictures that's emerging in this comparison here. So those are the numbers. Um, I want you to pay particular attention to these, the efficiency numbers. As you look at them, what I'm hoping you will glean is that there's a pattern here. The efficiency for the Carnot cycle is greater than the efficiency for any of the other cycles. We'll talk about this more in chapter four, but Carnot cycle is the ideal heat engine cycle in the sense that given any two extreme operating temperatures, it's the Carnot cycle that's going to give you the highest possible efficiency. You can kind of figure out why that's the case by looking at the Stirling cycle, where the efficiency is much lower. But Stirling cycle is so much similar to Carnot cycle. In fact, even the amount of work done is very similar. They are both quite large. But the reason Stirling cycle is so much less efficient 
is because there's more heat input. With the Carnot cycle, these two isothermal curves were connected by adiabatic curves. So there was no heat input then. But with the Stirling cycle, it's not adiabatic, it's isochoric. So there is a heat input there. And that's what's reducing the efficiency of a Stirling engine. Although this number actually is more realistic, except because of the operation of Stirling engine, it cannot run at 1500 Kelvin. A more likely temperature for Stirling engine would be something like 700 Kelvin. So with the auto and diesel cycle, what's uh, more wasteful here compared to the Carnot cycle is that even though this is the highest operating temperature, not all heat input is at this temperature. At this point, it actually starts out at temperature of something close to, I think, 1300 Kelvin. So some heat input occurs at lower temperature, and that's ultimately going to be what's responsible for this lower efficiency. And it's the same deal for the diesel cycle. All right, I think that's enough uh, foreshadowing. For now, what I want you to pay attention to is that the Carnot efficiency is the highest efficiency. So if we just want to estimate efficiency of a heat engine, and let's say as a matter of a bare minimum of parameters, we know the operating temperatures, then we can estimate the maximum possible efficiency by using the Carnot efficiency. And pretty soon you will see the formula for the Carnot efficiency, which is actually much, much simpler than auto, diesel, or Stirling cycle efficiencies. All right, so until next lecture, bye.